Hello and welcome again to The Goddess in Art. Our program is dedicated to the power and creativity of the Goddess. In our program tonight, we are going to be taking a new look at the Bible, at the story of Genesis, as the story of women who, were, who held powerful social positions, who were most likely priestesses, and during certain religious ceremonies seen as the Goddess incarnate. My name is Star Goody. And my guest this evening is Savina Tubal, who, is writing, who wrote a book called Sarah the Priestess, the first matriarch of Genesis, and is currently writing a book on Hagar. She holds a doctorate in ancient Near Eastern studies and is an affiliated scholar at the University of Southern California. Welcome, Savina. Thank you. Nice to be here. Savina, as, as a scholar of ancient Near Eastern studies and with your own Hebrew background, when you read the Bible, you can read it directly as written. You don't have to rely on one other people's interpretations and you don't have to rely on other people's translations. And when you were reading Genesis, you found things and passages that were very enigmatic and, and really were contrary and didn't make sense in terms of Jewish thought or patriarchal social structure. So I would like you to tell us first maybe the story of Sarah and then some of the things that you found in these translations and you know what you were up against. No, first I'd, li I'd like to mention that uh, it is very important to, uh, to be able to read the text in the original because it makes a big difference. Uh, for instance, I I'll just give you one example, one small example. Uh, when you read the Bible in English, the God is always called either Lord or God Almighty or something like that, and you don't realize that there are different gods that you're mm -hmm. talking about. You're ca talking about El Elyon or El Shaddai, or, um, and that's also important in the interpretation. Um, the, the traditional uh, story of Sarah, uh, <coughs> Sarah is uh, presented as being barren, and uh, she has a handmaid whom she presents to her husband so that uh, he can have a child. He can have a son, is, is generally what they say. And her, her husband <coughs> is Abraham. <coughs> and her husband is Abraham. And, uh, and then, uh, so, she, so anyway, she pre pre presents uh, this handmaid to Abraham, and uh, she, be she conceives the, the uh, Egyptian handmaid, whose name is Hagar, or Hagar. Uh, she conceives, and then she becomes insulting to Sarah. And uh, so Sarah gets very angry with her, and uh, uh, Hagar flees. She goes off to the desert and escapes. That's the traditional story. Um, what I began to see, first of all, with my, with my uh, mes um, ancient Near Eastern studies uh, background, uh, there are some laws which uh, are very um, sort of illustrate the story of Sarah, or vice versa. Sarah illustrates the story. Uh, for instance, in, in one of the uh, laws made by a general called Hammurabi, uh, who lived in about the 17th century BCE in, uh, in Babylonia. Right. And uh, one of his laws say that if a, if a woman marries a, um, a man and uh, she has a handmaid, and she gives her handmaid to her, um, to her husband, and that maid conceives and then becomes insolent, she may mark her with the mark of a slave. And what that means is that she's demoting her. And uh, I wondered why nobody had ever noticed that before. Yes. Uh, it, it seems so obvious, and, and this has been, uh, these um, laws have been known for at least about 50 or 60 years now. And one of the reasons they say is, well, Sarah wasn't a priestess, so it doesn't apply. So I began to think, what if she were a priestess? What, who were these priestesses? So I really got involved in the Mesopotamian priestesses. And uh, one of the um, major characteristics of these priestesses is that they should be barren. Mm -hmm. They were not, I shouldn't say barren, they should be childless. 
they remained childless because they were the um, the wife of the god, and therefore uh, their fertility was the fertility of the land and the fertility of the people and uh, and that kind of thing. So really, in a way, part of what you're saying is that um, when we read the Bible, uh, there's a lot more. You know, there's been different interpretations and things, and we think of it as just, oh, well, this monotheistic God, and it just right there from the beginning. But what you're saying is there's a cultural milieu, and there were priestesses and other cultural contexts going on at that time, and that when you were looking at this other cultural context in um, Babylonia, seeing this law, that it hit you that this was the same story, and it, it was like a clue that there were other things going on there in the story. Mm -hmm. And then taking up, now barren, now that's an interesting word, like the translation of that word. There's a story that hangs on that <laughs> translation. <laughs> that absolutely is. <laughs> and the story that hangs on that is that the Hebrew word is akara. Mm -hmm. And akara can be uh, either interpreted or uh, translated as childless or barren. But if you read the English version of the Bible, it's always translated barren. And the implication of that is that that uh, God had to intervene in the in the conception of the children of the barren women, and so that brings the male God into. Uh, whereas, in fact, it was if they were priestesses, which I think they were, like Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel. All right. um, if they were really priestesses, then they remained childless from their own uh, volition from their own will, because they belong to a certain order, a priestly order. In other words, that was part of, of the vows of being a priestess. That's that one, right. one was not a mother, but one was a priestess, or um, served the goddess or the god. Well, they served, uh, uh, they served various goddesses. Mm -hmm. It depends where they lived. Mm -hmm. The, the um, uh, Mesopotamia was, had city-states, and each city-state had uh, a god and goddess as a, a protector of the state. And th uh, these uh, priests and priestesses, but particularly the priestesses, um, uh, were more or less in, 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 in some of their, um, some of the ritual that they officiated, they became the priestess incarnate. They literally were the goddess incarnate, I mean. They became the, the actual goddess. And um, I think that this is, that this is the kind of thing that uh, that happened in uh, in Canaan as well, in Canaan, where where uh, Abraham and Sarah went. They left Mesopotamia, and they came to uh, to the land of Canaan, to what is today uh, Israel, and. Uh, has been Palestine. Yes, that was something I wanted to say too, because the area that Sarah was from, like the goddess Anana, the moon goddess, was very prevalent there. And going to Canaan, we have like some of the old Hebrew goddesses or Canaan goddesses of Asherah or Astarte. So that you know, there were goddesses there. Well, this, it, it's interesting. Perhaps when we watch the uh, the the slides, I can show you that um, one particular goddess, and it's the only goddess of. Uh, of Mesopotamia is called Ningal. And Ningal actually travels from Mesopotamia all the way to, uh, to, Can to Canaan and becomes Nikau. She's uh, in Syria and in, in Canaan. And she's the only goddess. And that's the goddess that I think that Sarah was involved with. Hmm. Even though she lived in a terebinth of, uh, a, a terebinth is a tree, mm -hmm. and she lived in this grove. But that tree, that grove that she, uh, the kind of trees she lived in, uh, was symbolic of the goddess uh, Asherah. So they were, they really had goddesses and gods too and spirits in their lives. It's something that we don't perhaps even understand today. So, okay, what, again, some of your clues were seeing that Sarah's situation aligned with these old, these codes from um, Mesopotamia and in a goddess area. and. Also, that she lived in a sacred area. Now, that this the residence of where she lived. Now, that's part of a, a priestess tradition too, isn't it? I mean, that showed you there was a different. Well, there sort were different kinds of priests. It's very, very difficult. It's a very long story yeah. because there are there there were many kinds of women uh, attached to religious institutions mm -hmm. or just simply living in in uh, in the cities, uh, but who had religious functions, and so we don't really know which function belonged to which priestess even in Mesopotamia. So it's very difficult to say uh, about, uh, about Sarah and, and Rachel particularly. But since 
Sarah and Rachel both have the uh, giving of their handmaid to, to the husband. And what they did was, uh, in Hebrew it says that they, Ibane, that they wanted to build up their, um, their house. It wasn't as it's translated in English that they had that they wanted to give a son to the husband, but uh, Ibane could be read also Ben, and Ben in, in Hebrew is son. So they they changed it a little bit. Yes, <laughs> really is is what it amounts to. Um, so Sarah is building up her estate, really. It isn't like that she's offering her maiden so right. that the great patriarch can have a male heir to inherit his possessions. As exactly. A but she says she wants, she's doing it to, to, to increase her estates, which is a very different situation. It's, it's very different. That actually led me to, uh, to look at the uh, social structure of Genesis. And, uh, you know, we're, we're taught traditionally that uh, the, the Abraham was the big patriarch and that he had the power of life and death over all his children and slaves and wife and you know that <coughs> that image of a patriarch and uh, actually it's not so um, for instance one of the characteristics of patriarchy is is patriliny in mm -hmm. which uh, uh, the son inherits from the father whether it's uh, his property or his uh, title or his uh, no, this is the oldest son always inherits. always the eldest son the eldest son uh, inherits right and, uh, but if you read the Bible, you'll see that it was always the youngest son that inherited, not the, not the, I mean, they always give a, a reason, and generally the reason is because it's the mother's fault, you know, she did something terrible so that the eldest uh, child was invalidated. But actually, it, um, throughout history, even up until the time of David, David is also a youngest son, Solomon is a youngest son you get the, the uh, it's, it's called ultimo genita, uh -huh. the succession of the youngest. Uh, so um, that, that was an important uh, clue to me, for instance. And these are points that like traditional patriarchal scholarship just don't take up. I mean, they, they don't really... No, they're so used to reading it in a, in a traditional way that uh, it, it hasn't even occurred to them to look at it uh, differently. And it, it never occurs to them to look at it in, uh, from a woman's point of view. And th this has been uh, the important uh, part, of, I think, of my work, was that, that uh, I suddenly looked at it with a woman's eye. Mm. I'd like to take a look at some of the first uh, pieces of art that you brought to show that, that uh, the stature of these priestesses it was reflected in the art and in the community. Mm -hmm. and, there, and we know in Mesopotamia there were vast temple complexes dedicated to these different goddesses. So I'd like to see some of the art that you brought. Tell us about this piece. Yes, this is, um, this is a beautiful alabaster piece. Uh, actually, it's in the uh, University Museum in, in uh, Chicago. She's uh, alabaster and her eyes are lapis lazuli. Mm. And she's wearing the headdress is, uh, is uh, symbolic of her being a priestess. I see, the, the band around <coughs> the her band head. Around the band around the head. They wear, uh, you'll see perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, in another one, uh, the, the clothes. They always wore similar uh, attire, uh, these priestesses. This is actually a mask, um, but I, I wanted to show that because, unfortunately, we we're used to talking about what's very early in time historically as primitive, mm -hmm. and really these uh, people were um, very sophisticated. They were. Um, just as intelligent as we are, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, they invented writing, for instance, in, uh, in about 5,000 years ago, over 5,000 years ago. But the, the invention of writing is just an invention uh, uh, of a new way of communicating in the same way that we have invented computers. Now, now this <coughs> is a map that shows us some of the area like where Sarah's from. I don't know if people can see it, but it's just above the Persian Gulf there, the area of Ur, and they yes, traveled up north. Yes, on the right hand north. side. On the right hand side, you see, uh, God said to Abram, supposedly, uh, go from your land and go to the land of Canaan. Well, the land of Canaan is on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that looks like a finger, well, yeah. just further up is, is uh, Canaan. So they came from the, from the uh, right hand corner, and instead of crossing over, which they could easily have done, they went all the way north to Haran, mm -hmm. to, another, to another city. And 
um, they, here you can see the uh, the priestess attire. They wore these dresses that were like flounced. They're not quite sure what they were made of, but uh, she too has the same headdress. Uh, this uh, this is um, a priestess called Enna Tuma, I think her name was. En means lady, like uh, lord uh -huh. and lady. And uh, this uh, is a statue dedicated to this goddess Ningal that I was telling you about, uh, who traveled from Mesopotamia to Canaan. And now, these pieces are all around, they're from the same area of, of Sarah and Abraham, and they're, um, they're also the same era that you kind of place the, their story, which is around 3000 BC. Most of these, these pieces are, are They're all know. from about 5,000 years ago. Yes. Um, also, one of the things that was a clue to you about uh, somewhat the power of Sarah was um, her involvement in, in who her son married or the, the, the matrifocal descent group. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, there are various characteristics to a matrifocal or a woman-oriented society. Uh, one of them is that they, uh, when a man marries, the wife does not come into his house. He goes to the, to the wife's house because the nucleus of the family is the mother, the grandmother, the sisters and the daughters, and the sons, of course, but it's really a, a, a female line. Mm. And uh, of course, all these matriarchs had son, sons, <laughs> somehow they, <laughs> they, they didn't have one daughter amongst them, but uh, um, one of the characteristics in the, in the biblical stories is that the, um, the marriages are always matrifocal, in other words, the, the male goes to the, uh, to the female's uh, house, to, or, the, or the mother's, uh, <coughs> the daughter's mother. And <coughs> another thing, too, is in, in looking at it, um, you know, there, there was Sarah, and then there's Rebecca and Rachel, and these are the, the different generations in the story of Genesis, and all of them were, quote, unquote, barren. So what, what are these, you know, patriarchs doing with these, these barren women? I mean, they could have divorced them. And you, this was sort of a clue to you, again, that they were priestesses and part of that they were fulfilling other sacred functions. Well, actually, again, coming back to the Hammurabi law, according, mm -hmm. to, uh, according to Hammurabi, if a man's wife was barren, literally barren, uh, he could divorce her or take another wife or take a concubine. Or, and so I was really surprised that when, when I started to calculate that these women had been, quote, barren for <laughs> like 30 years, Sarah's barren, yeah. and 20 years, Rebecca, uh, that's, that gave me the clue, too, that that was one of the characteristics of the priestesses. Um, but that wasn't enough to substantiate the, the uh, the fact that uh, they were perhaps from a religious order. So um, I began to look at other parts of, uh, of what these priestesses, of the function of the priestesses, and what they, what they did. And one of the functions of a priestess was um, what, we, what is always called either sacred prostitution or sacred marriage, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually a very derogatory term. Yes. Uh, I've, uh, that, again, the translation, right? Uh, uh, it's like, always a translation. Yeah. It's the uh, Hairos Gamos, which is, really means a mystic wedding. Ah. Is, uh, it would actually be the translation. And, um, now, and now this is a ceremony. Tell us what this ceremony is. The ceremony of yeah. the Hairos Gamos? Yeah. Um, the, cer the ceremony, first of all, it, ca it came from the uh, belief of the uh, Mesopotamians that the gods themselves ha had this interaction, this uh, sexual uh, meeting, and that this caused the wonders of the world. Oh. And so, <laughs> uh, so to speak. And so the, um, the uh, priestess who, was, uh, who represented the goddess, at least she represented the goddess and became, I think, they really believe that she was the goddess incarnate, when she also uh, took that function of um, having a, a sacred or mystic ma uh, marriage, a, a mystic wedding. And um, the reason for this was that she was to choose who the, um, the new leader was going to be or whether the old leader was sufficiently in, in uh, good condition physically and mentally and spiritually to, to take over the, uh, uh, um, the ruling of the, of the, of the people. And, um, one of the uh, 
special elements of the, uh, of the, of the wedding was that the priestess stood at the gate or at the door of the temple and received the bridegroom uh, into her abode. And this abode was the storehouse because the, uh, one of the, many, many of the goddesses did take part in this uh, ritual, but the, uh, the one very well-known one is Inanna, the goddess Inanna of uh, Uruk. And, uh, now, now this connects too with, with Sarah at her tent because there's an interesting story of, of Sarah and you know, often there are things happening around her tent, so I was wondering if you could connect this with Sarah. Well, you see, it was, it was never really understood why uh, there's, there's a story where three men come to visit uh, Abraham, of course, <laughs> and uh, it turns out that there are, they are two angels and a god. Mm. And then the, the, uh, the gods are telling Abraham that Sarah is going to have a child. And then there's this little story about Sarah being in the tent door and uh, laughing because she uh, doesn't believe she's going to have a child and actually um, the, the, that special element of her standing at the door in her quote tent uh, is, is the most, uh, was the most important uh, feature of the Sumerian wedding of the priestess with the god. All right, let's take a look at some of the other uh, pieces of art that you brought because we have actual like a vase that shows this. Uh -huh. and, uh, so let's take a look at that. Yeah. Okay, now here we have the map of Canaan and we see here uh, the Dead Sea and we see here Mamre where Sarah was living and we know that that was a sacred area and where her tent was. Yes. Uh, and then you can see further down to the south you see is Beersheba. Beersheba is really where Abraham lived a great deal of the time, according to the Bible. And you never hear co uh, scholars comment on this either. Right. But uh, actually, Sarah's re residence was in the area of Hebron, mm -hmm. and uh, Mamre in particular, but she was buried in Hebron. All right. Okay, now here we have this Uruk face, and this is about, what, 3,000? Is this 3,000 BC? Or? Yes, this is around 3,000 BC, and it comes from Uruk, it comes from the, the uh, area of the temple of Inanna. And this represents the sacred marriage here. And uh, yes, this whole vase, it's also an alabaster, it's about uh, four or five feet tall. I haven't seen it actually because it's in, uh, in Syria. But uh, you see there's the priestess standing at uh, the gate. Is, uh, those two staffs look like staffs, they're ring bu bundles. And those are the uh, symbols of Inanna's gate. And that is Inanna standing there. And this is inside her temple. You can see all the, the food, the storehouse. Now uh, this is a man bringing? No. Yeah, uh, this is the priest. Oh, that is the, yeah. the priest, yes. yes. That's the priest bringing uh, the gifts. He's uh -huh. the first priest um, bringing the gifts. And th here we have the priestesses. And those are the priestesses inside, uh, inside the temple. Uh, I think one's p pouring a libation. In other words, they're, they're preparing the marriage. Right. Uh, and you can see the vases in the back. Here's, here's Inanna's, uh, th this was Inanna's uh, temple, the original temple, which was a storehouse. What happened was that she collected all the foods for times of famine or times of pestilence, and then it was distributed. In other words, the, the priestess had the power of, of life and death of, uh -huh. the, of the community. and. Uh, that became symbolically her, her, uh, her temple, even though later on it, it was built up into a tremendous uh, complex of, uh, with the ziggurat, you know, the famous uh, pyramid and, and the complexes where these priestesses lived, because a lot of these priestesses also were confined like nuns into, in, uh, in some of these temples, in, in the temple complexes. So th there is a sense of uh, Sarah's tent as being kind of the abode of the goddess and uh, very sacred place. The feeling was that it's called, I, my feeling is that it was called a tent because it, it symbolized the goddess's tent. tent. And in fact you have uh, the, uh, there's a, a part in the, in the Bible where th the women are sewing uh, these, what they called batim, and they said the uh, interpretation was that they were hangings because they couldn't be houses. Ba uh, bayit is actually house and batim are houses. 
So what I think they were weaving, these women, were houses of the goddess, the little tents that they probably gave us you know, on, on a certain occasion, on a certain holiday or whatever it was. And so they were actually were making tents, and they were making little tents like we saw just a minute ago. And also in that, is that uh, of Sarah standing at the door in that story too, when the angels come, that whole sense of her being at the entrance of the tent that is so reminiscent of the um, a non a marriage ceremony that that's part of it is of opening the tent. Well, in fact, afterwards she does conceive and she does have the child. So uh, to me, that was an un uh, the Annunciation. It was more than the Annunciation. In fact, it was the marriage, uh, the sa the sacred or mystic marriage between herself and the God who came to the tent. There are two. St there are two or three stories uh, in which you can. Um, perhaps identify the, the uh, mystic wedding. Uh, two of them, Sarah goes to, one, once to Egypt and once to uh, a place called Gerar, which is fairly close to uh, Hebron. So, so Sarah really is more truly the matriarch of a race because if, if of, of the Jewish race, because if it's Sarah and God conceiving, I mean, it, the great patriarch is sort of off to the side here. It's the not really Sarah. The great patriarch is off to the side a great deal. <laughs> the great, in fact, the two great patriarchs were both Abraham and, uh, and Isaac. Isaac's a very fade, uh, faded figure. There's really not much to him. And the wives are very strong. Rebecca is a very strong person, actually a wonderful personality. Well, I'd like to thank you for being my guest tonight, Savina, and also for your work, for, for giving women this model of this powerful woman, Sarah, and also for your work for restoring Sarah to her rightful place in history. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having me. <laughs> In